Hello, and welcome to today's lecture on Chapter 8, Communicating with Friends and Family. This is a part of our series on interpersonal communication, and our book has different chapters that focus on relationships with your friend and family, as well as relationships with romantic partners. But this chapter is about communicating with friends and family. So let's talk about the importance of friends and family. People typically treat friends as equals, and in your life, you have various types of friendships, and you can design these friendships to suit your needs as well the needs of your friends. And you've got different levels of friendships. So you've got acquaintances, you've got classmates, you've got neighbors, you've got friends from high school and, and elementary school possibly. So each of these relationships is unique and you share a unique history with that person. Now people who share affection and resources as a family and who think of themselves as a family and present themselves as a family are indeed a family. So it's difficult in this day and age to say that your family is, are the people that brought you into this world because they're adopted children, they're people that consider very close friends as their family. In fact, I like to call my friends who are family my family, which is a combination of the two words. Now let's look at the different factors that people typically look at when choosing people to be their friends. So one thing that is absolutely true is that we are attracted to people that are similar to us and we look for people that share the same commonalities with us. So that would be a number one reason why we would be friends with someone, that we share common interests and likes. Also, we may be attracted to or have friends that are completely opposite of us and they balance us out. So say you're an introvert and you have a friend that's an extrovert. That difference can actually help strengthen your relationship when you have complementary factors involved. Also, people typically choose people that they like and appreciate to be their friend uh, as well as have admiration for. And another key factor that people look at when deciding to be a friend to somebody or be someone's friend is someone who that they can open up to, someone that they can look up to. And that's very important because we talked about disclosure and self-disclosing. And I couldn't see myself spending time with people or a significant amount of time with someone that I don't feel like I could trust or share information with. Also, we choose people to be our friends that we would interact quite frequently with, although in this day and age, because of time and distance and so forth, sometimes it's not so easy to have physical interaction, so we rely on our friendships to be online. And then also the last thing that people look at when deciding to be friends with someone is if the relationship is rewarding to them. Obviously, it should have some kind of benefit. Uh, that person brings out the best in you. That person makes you smile, makes you laugh. You always have a good time with them. Think about the, the joys and the benefits that a certain types of your friends bring into your life and, and think about the reasons why you're friends with them. You might find it interesting. All right, so now let's take a look at four reasons why you don't have to be perfect to be a good friend. And we all know that friendships take work. Any type of relationships takes work. So, but to be that perfect friend can sometimes be a challenge because you can't be all things to all people. So one thing that you have to keep in mind is that first impressions can be misleading. I'm a very big believer in first impressions and making your best possible first impression, but we tend to overestimate the similarities that we have with our friends, and we tend to underestimate the similarities we have to people that we may not know so well. So keep in mind that your first impression is not necessarily going to be how that person actually is. They might, have, they might be having a bad day, like we all do from time to time. Also, perfection can be a turnoff. I know uh, we strive for that, we aim for that, but let's, let's face it, nobody's perfect, right? And no one wants to be around someone who's constantly perfect because we don't want to feel or look bad 
in comparison to our friend. But sometimes we have that friend who just seems like they have it all together all the time. Now, one thing I want you to remember about tr you don't have to be perfect to be a good friend is that it's not all about communication, but it's a lot about communication. So what does that mean? It means communication is, is not 100% everything. However, it is extremely important in terms of your relationships. And studies have shown that the, that the frequency and the depth and the disclosure that you have with your friends determines the longevity of that relationship. So working on your communication and, and aiming to be a more competent communicator is only going to help you in your personal relationships as well as your professional relationships. And then, of course, making an effort can bridge differences between you and your friends. Let's face it, life isn't easy. Relationships are hard, and all relationships take work and effort. But sometimes breaking free of your comfort zone and, and extending an olive branch to somebody and, and meeting them halfway or just trying to take their perspective is going to help solidify that relationship. As I stated earlier, relationships take work, and they're not always easy, although some are definitely easier than others just because of people's personalities and how they blend together. So now let's take a look at the different types of friendships, of interpersonal relationships that you may have and the factors that define them. So you might have short-term or long-term relationships with people. You might have heard the saying, people come into your life for a reason or for a season. And I think we can all agree with that, that we've had lifelong friends that no matter what, no matter how long of a time gap there is between speaking with them, you can just pick up right where you left off like no time had ever passed. And then there are people that just come into your life for a certain period of time and usually for a specific reason. But remember, your life changes. And with those life changes, some of your friendships change. And it's natural to have to let go of some people that are not bringing positive energy into your life. And I encourage you to examine the relationships that you have and see if some of them may need may need to be reevaluated. Another type of friendship is a high disclosure or a low disclosure relationship. So you need to ask yourself, you know, is this someone that I can completely trust? Is this someone that I feel comfortable sharing with? Or is this someone that I have a low disclosure level with that I like and that person's cool, but I wouldn't necessarily give that person or share with that person my deepest, darkest secret. Also, relationships can be categorized as doing or being oriented. So this is doing would be tasks and activities. So working out with that person, playing tennis with that person, doing yard work or, or activities with that person. Whereas being oriented is just spending time with that person, just hanging out, having conversations, laying on a blanket and looking up at the sky you know, listening to music together. So there's different types of, of levels between being and doing oriented. Another factor in your friendships are whether they're low or high obligation. And that's pretty self-explanatory. So if you have a friend that you have a low obligation to, you're not necessarily going to go out of your way to help them in a time of need. But you have other friends that are high obligation, in which case you would give them their shirt off your back, you would bail them out of jail, you would be that person they could call at 2 a.m. if you were in trouble and they needed your help. And then there are people... There are relationships that you have where you have either frequent contact or occasional contact. And I think proximity has a lot to do with that. We tend, at when we're, especially when we're younger, to be friends with the neighborhood kids, right? Because they're convenient. They're, they're next door. They're across the street. But as you age and as you're able to drive and have more freedom, you're not necessarily going to hang out with these people because you have options and you have choices. But there are people that you you naturally spend more time with and others that you you wish you could spend more time with but you just can't because of the physical distance between you. So we all want to know how we can become a better friend, right? I, I certainly want to know. So I'm going to share with you right now seven communication strategies to help you be a better friend. So the first one is, and this is pretty obvious, 
be a good listener. We talked about the importance of listening and how it's the most critical communication skill for you as a student here at Georgia Highlands College. But being a good listener involves being mindful, being present, and listening with listening physically, listening mentally, and having a listening goal. So what do I mean by that? Listening physically means facing the person, looking at them, having eye contact. Listen mentally is putting the distractions away, you know, clearing out your mind and really focusing on what that person's saying. And then knowing your listening goal is, what is the purpose for me to be listening to my friend right now? Is it listening for support? Is it listening to analyze a message? Is it listening for retention? All the different reasons we talked about in the chapter on listening. Another strategy is to give advice sparingly. Everyone has an opinion, right? But not everyone really wants to hear your opinion. So unless your advice is solicited, you may want to watch how much advice you give to people. Because again, sometimes people just want to be heard. Also, you want to share your feelings respectfully. You never want to intentionally or unintentionally hurt someone's feelings. So be careful about that. Another thing that's easier said than done is to apologize and forgive. Personally, I think the hardest two, langu the hardest two words in the English, lang English language to say are, I'm sorry. And I think you would agree with me that it's easier said than done. But when you forgive someone and, and you apologize, it sometimes can really make a world of difference. The next item you can do to become a better friend is to be validating and appreciative of that person. Show that person that you care. Give them that comfort. Show them that you value them. I think that is something that's really missing in today's day and age. You also want to stay loyal, especially in hard times. It's interesting to see who is your true friend uh, when life gets tough. And we all go through our times, and I think we have found who we really can count on when the times get tough. You also want to be trustworthy. You, if, if someone tells you something in confidence, keep that confidence. Respect it. Don't betray it. We all know what it feels like to have our confidences broken. And then you want to give and take equally. I think we've all been in relationships or friendships when we're with a taker, where we're, we're with someone that constantly is always asking something from you or of you, and you're always the giver. And that really gets old after a while. Um, relationships should be reciprocal, and so you should think about that as well. So those were the seven strategies for becoming a better friend. Now let's talk about gender and relationship, uh, because males and females, as we know, communicate differently. We have different strategies for communication and different goals. Now male friendships according to research, often involved good-natured competition, and they focus more on activities, whereas female friends tend to treat each other more as equals and engage more in emotional support and self-disclosure. So females are more likely to self-disclose than males are. And one thing I, wanted, I want you to think about, and we'll talk about when we meet in class, is do you feel that heterosexual men and women can be just friends? Is this possible? Women say typically yes, but men are less certain of this. And I know it's not a one size fits all. It really depends on the individuals, but just some food for thought. Also, men find it validating when women encourage when their female friends encourage them to be emotionally expressive and women say they often appreciate the opportunity to be concrete and direct with guy friends so think about it guys are usually direct and to the point they don't beat around the bush they don't add a lot of details to the conversation like women do so again that's part of the differences in gender communication but Having friendships with diverse people can definitely help diminish your prejudice. I think that it's advantageous and beneficial for you to have friends from different walks of life. I think that enriches us as a person and it helps us just grow and become more open-minded. So now we're gonna move along to the section on online friendships and how they differ from having in-person friendships. 
And as you know, face-to-face -face communication is very rewarding and very enriching, but sometimes it's just not possible to do so. So here are some of the differences in online versus face-to-face -face friendship. So there's greater diversity online of the amount of people you're going to be friends with because of your exposure to people that are in different states or in different parts of the world. One item on online friendships and disclosure is that many people share more in person, at least at first. Now, I think the level of self-disclosure, again, depends on factors, depends on the individual and how well they know that person. As we, as we have learned, you self-disclose when you feel it's safe to do so with that person. Also, online communication can be less anxiety provoking. I have heard from many of my students that they feel anxiety having to have face-to-face -face conversations with people or phone calls with people because it's awkward, because they don't know what to say next. And they're so used to typing their responses in a text that it's often difficult for them to have a face-to-face -face conversation. Also, online communication transcends time and space. It's, you know, I have friends all over the world from China to Europe to South America that I communicate with daily. And thank goodness for online communication, for, for WhatsApp and for FaceTime and, and for all the wonders that our technology brings us. And the last thing I want to talk about with online friendships is that, that you're more likely to have more online friends that you can actually keep up with. So I don't know if you've ever taken a look at your friends list and, and asked yourself, are these people really my friends? I mean, who are these people? And I don't know about you, but I find it exhausting to keep up with everybody. And I often tell my friends, if I don't like your picture or comment, I just, I didn't see it. Um, as we know, the one, one of the downfalls of social media is that it's just such a time consuming activity. And there was an anthropologist named Robin Dunbar who professed that there is a Dunbar's number. So what that is is that people have only a certain amount of mental and emotional energy for no more than 150 friends at a time. Now, I don't know how much mental energy you have, but as, as we know, all friendships take work, whether they're in person or online. So be careful on how much time you're investing because you have other things to attend to in your lives as well. Now let's talk about parenting relationships. Not many of you are parents, but I can definitely say that you have parents and each of your families it operates in a unique situation. So parent, uh, families may make decisions based on conformity or conversations with their children. And the children either are gonna be accepting of that or not. So let's talk about the family dynamic. So if your family, if your family's parenting style is more focused on conversation, then they're more likely to talk openly and possibly negotiate a curfew. Whereas if your parents have more of a conforming style, they're just gonna expect you to follow their rules with no questions asked. Another aspect of parenting that I wanted to talk about is that the styles may vary from authoritarian to authoritative to permissive. So let's talk, look at these three. The first is authoritarian, which is basically my way or the highway. It's because I'm the mom and I said so. You probably have heard that before. And an authoritative parenting style is firm and strict However, they do encourage conversation with their children and they're open to that. So it's, a, it's more flexible than the authoritarian style. And then the final type of parenting style is a permissive style where really there aren't any rules. The parents really aren't parenting. And although you may think that's a great idea and that's pretty awesome, I think your views on that will change when you become a parent yourself. So now let's talk about sibling relationships. Many of you have siblings. We've talked about whether you're an only child or 
have brothers or sisters and you all have different relationships with your siblings. And we're going to talk about five different sibling relationships. So the first one is called supportive. And you can imagine that's a really good one. This is one where you talk. There's a lot of talk and a lot of communication with your siblings. The second one is a longing relationship. And this is where you admire your siblings, but you interact less frequently than you would like. Some of you might have siblings that are much older than you and say they're married and have children of their own or, or live in a different town or state, which makes it more difficult to see them regularly. So you might have that longing for that relationship with them. This happens also when you are younger and say your older brother goes off to college and moves out of the house. Now, the third type of sibling relationship is a competitive one, and you might be very aware of that. If you have brothers or sisters, you're highly competitive, whether it comes to sports or academics, but sometimes this rivalry extends into adulthood, so it's not just when you're kids. You can be full-grown adults and have a very competitive relationship with your siblings. The next one, the next two are not so great. They're, they're going down on a negative plane. The next one is an apathetic relationship. And this is where you only really see your siblings on special occasions or holidays. And then the last one is definitely one that I would not promote. And that's a hostile relationship with your siblings. This is where you speak very little to them, if at all, or you just completely stop communicating with them and, and don't have any contact at all. So the last area that we're going to discuss here on this chapter on communicating with friends and family is how you can strengthen your family ties. And, and I'm going to give you eight tips for doing this. So the first one is to share family stories, to recall stories of when you were younger, or to ask your parents to, to tell you stories about things that you or your brothers or sisters did when they were younger. Also listening. I can't emphasize that enough, being a good listener and, and keeping your mouth shut while your siblings or your parents are talking and listening mindfully to what they have to say. Also negotiating privacy rules. That's really important. Sometimes we feel like our privacy is not, we don't have any at all, right? Especially if we have to share a room with a sibling. So you want to negotiate some privacy rules and really stick to them. You also want to work on your conflict management. As we know, the one constant in our life is that we have conflict. We have conflict within our families. And so you need to work on how to properly manage that conflict. Conflict isn't necessarily bad. It's how you manage it that's important. Also, you want to share confirming messages. We talked about confirming messages and disconfirming messages. Very important to validate your family by giving them uplifting and positive messages. You know, a compliment goes a really long way and it can even ignite a positive spiral, which is what you want. And then last but not least, have fun together. That's what life is all about. You have to look for the fun. You have to look for the joy. Yes, there's everyday tasks that we have to do. We have to cook, we have to clean. There's things that we need to do. But if you do it with a smile on your face and joy in your heart, you can really enjoy your time with your family so much more. So thanks for listening to me today and I look forward to our next lecture.